Coming up on Jerusalem Dateline, a nation mourns as the six hostages killed by Hamas last week are laid to rest. And terrorist violence in Judea and Samaria threaten the peace of Jerusalem and beyond. Plus, the politics of protest, Middle East analyst John Waggy weighs in on the push to unseat Benjamin Netanyahu. And the price of war. Chuck Holton visits tourist sites in Jordan that look like ghost towns. All this and more coming up on this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. Hello and welcome to the Jerusalem Dateline. I'm Julie Stahl. These are days of anger and grief in Israel after Hamas executed six hostages, including 23-year-old American Israeli Hirsch Goldberg Pauline. It happened as Israeli forces were closing in for a possible rescue. An autopsy found the hostages were shot at close range several times. Chuck Holton brings us the story. A few hours ago, we informed the families that the bodies of their loved ones had been located by IDF troops in an underground tunnel in Rafah. According to our initial assessment, they were brutally murdered by Hamas terrorists shortly before we reached them. The nation is mourning as six hostages, including American citizen Hirsch Goldberg Poland, were found murdered in Gaza. Just a few days before this tragic discovery, Hirsch's mother, Rachel, stood at the Gaza border shouting a blessing to her son. May God bless you and keep you. May God shine his face upon you and be gracious to you. And may God give you peace. The brutal killing sparked outrage. And today, protesters are planning a nationwide strike as some Israelis blame Prime Minister Netanyahu for not being willing to approve a ceasefire deal. But Netanyahu says a deal must have acceptable terms, and Israel must be able to stop Hamas from attacking Israel again. The fact that Hamas is continuing to perpetrate atrocities like those it carried out on October 7th requires us to do everything so that it will be unable to perpetrate these atrocities again. Amidst the grief, Israeli children returned to school on Sunday. They got more of mixed emotions. On one hand, we are happy to be back at some routine. On the other hand, we can still hear the booms in the background. We hope, at least for the kids, for some normal routine. On Sunday, a drive-by shooting near Hebron left three Israeli police officers dead. IDF forces tracked down the shooter, who was killed in a subsequent gun battle. The terrorist was a member of the Palestinian Presidential Guard, a force that receives significant U.S. funding and training. Sunday's incident raises questions about the effectiveness of U.S.-funded security programs in the region. Israeli officials also say Hamas cannot be trusted. I believe the whole attitude towards Hamas must change by the world community and by the uh, interlocutors, by Arab nations, by intermediaries. They all have to understand that Hamas is not a partner to anything. As Israel navigates these multiple crises, attention remains focused on the hostages still in captivity. Israel reports that 101 hostages remain in Gaza with only 66 believed to be alive. The ongoing challenge is securing their release and safe return. Reporting from Israel, I'm Chuck Holton for CBN News. Jerusalem saw an outpouring of grief yesterday as one of the most well-known hostages, Hirsch Goldberg Pauline, was laid to rest just days after his brutal murder. Thousands of Israelis have taken to the streets in protest about his death and that of five other hostages. Some want Israel to make a deal with Hamas and others say any deal would play into Hamas's hands. Take a look. Thousands of Israelis streamed to Hirsch's funeral in grief and disbelief that he's now gone. Hirsch's mother spoke to her slain son. I know you're right here. I just have to teach myself how to feel you in a different way. And Hirsch, there's one last thing I need you to do for us. Now I need you to help us stay strong. And I need you to help us survive. Israeli President Isaac Herzog addressed the funeral of the dual U.S.-Israeli citizen who's become a symbol of the battle to free the hostages. I'm sorry I am that we didn't protect her on that dark day. I'm sorry I am that we failed to bring him home. Rachel Goldberg Pauline said she and her family were convinced her son would come home alive. For 23 years, I was privileged to have the most stunning honor 
to be Hirsch's mama. I'll take it and say thank you. I just wish it had been for longer. Hirsch's father also shared his grief, but a hope as well. For 330 days, Mama and I sought the proverbial stone that we could turn over to save you. Maybe, just maybe, your death is the stone, the fuel that will bring home the remaining 101 hostages. Hirsch and five other Israelis were murdered as Israeli soldiers were getting closer to freeing them. Hamas began releasing last messages of the six murdered hostages and suggested they will kill hostages Israel tries to rescue by force. Monday, President Biden blamed Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu for not doing enough to get a ceasefire deal to free the remaining hostages. Mr. President, do you think it's time for Prime Minister Netanyahu to do more on this issue? Do you think he's doing enough? No. Netanyahu told the nation Hamas is blocking the deal and he's more committed to freeing the hostages than anyone. I told the families and I repeat again tonight, I ask you for your forgiveness that we were not able to bring them back alive. We were close, but we didn't succeed. They murdered six of our hostages in cold blood. So after this horrible murder, I don't believe that someone serious would come and say, now make more concessions, you're not serious. Hamas is serious. I can't believe this happened. Hamas won't agree to a deal that allows Israeli troops to stay on the Philadelphia corridor that links Gaza to Egypt, which Netanyahu says is key to Israel's security. Philadelphia. Philadelphia Corridor. This is the oxygen and armament of Hamas. This corridor is different from other corridors, from other places. It is central. It determines our entire future. The deaths of the hostages sparked massive countrywide protests over the 11-month saga and calls for the government to do more to bring them home. Strikes called to force a hostage deal largely fizzled Monday and a court ruled them illegal. Many demonstrators are angry Israel won't agree to a ceasefire that frees the hostages, no matter the cost. The time has come to stand and to wake up, to do everything for the hostages to come back alive. Others who turned out to support the government say those protests are helping Hamas and harm Israel. The thing that they are doing now is destroying the unity of the people of Israel. Coming up, Protests in the wake of the recent hostage killings. Analysis from John Waggy and Julie Stahl. I'm joined now by our Middle East analyst, John Waggy. Welcome, John. We're seeing thousands of Israelis taken to the streets uh, in the wake of the murder of the six hostages uh, in Gaza, just as the IDF is, and troops are getting close. What do you make of these protests? And is the country as united in wanting a deal as the press might have us believe? I don't think so, Julie. Um, yeah, I think polls indicate something different. You can't always trust the polls, but I believe that there's still a solid, um, plurality, if not an outright majority, of people who don't necessarily want to jump to a deal. Um, the, the, the group that is um, supported by so many overseas and domestic interests and by the people, mostly in Tel Aviv, uh, are the Hostage Families Forum, and they, they um, have had a lot of influence in terms of providing the media with photos of, the, of all the hostages and that sort of thing. Um, and I know that they uh, are far and away the biggest group. Mm -hmm. But there is another group which you have talked to, and maybe you want to share about the Tikva Forum, because I haven't had as much experience with them as you have, and they have another point of view. Yeah, they, you know, I, I spoke with the, he, the, their spokesman is the father of a hostage, a current hostage, and uh, his name is more, his son is Eitan, and uh, their view is we've got to win this. And even if our, we have to lay down our, the lives of our kids, do not make a deal for, you know, for to get our, our kids out where we're going to let out more terrorists. Because, you know, Sinwar was uh, let out in the Gilad Shalit deal more than 10 years ago. And 
voila, we have this here now of, you know, this huge disaster on our hands, this war on our hands. So their, their, their ideal is, and, and Speaker even said, you know, if my son wasn't in Gaza as a hostage, he'd be in the army. So, you know, it, it's, it, they would be fighting. So, um, yeah, it's quite something. Yeah. Well, one of the points that really strikes me, and uh, I know that Netanyahu was really pretty exercised about holding to the principles he's, uh, he's been holding to, and I, I really think Israelis should be giving thanks that a prime minister who outlined the, the vision for what points were important at the beginning of the war, the return of the hostages was among them, mm -hmm. making sure Hamas never could threaten Israelis again was another one, and, and these points he has stuck to the entire time and he's saying we can't cave into a deal now and especially we can't give up on the Philadelphia corridor uh, which has a, become a grand central station basically for trafficking of humans of weapons of giant weapons yep. of ammunition you can't do that and yeah. I think most Israelis have a, an instinctive knowledge of that right. even though the pain of wanting the ho hostages back is overwhelming yeah and what do you think Hamas is thinking of this whole well, thing with it, the protests? It's, in, it's in their playbook. Yeah. Their playbook said, and, and Prime Minister Netanyahu announced that, that they have st a strategy to divide Israelis mm -hmm. and uh, and thereby weaken Israel in, in the effort. And so far they succeeded at that. I don't think they're going to in the long run, but they've succeeded up till now and it was really a body blow to have these hostages, hostages executed so close to the time that they might have been rescued. Well, thank you so much, John, for joining us. Thank you for your insights. Thanks. Up next, normally busy tourist sites in Jordan now sit empty, an economic casualty of war. The Israel-Hamas war has devastated lives and economies far beyond Gaza's borders. Our correspondent Chuck Holton traveled to Jordan to see the impact on one of the region's top tourist destinations. Petra, Jordan's crown jewel and a UNESCO World Heritage Site, normally bustles with thousands of visitors daily. Since October 7th, however, its rose-red facades and ancient streets have fallen eerily silent. No tourists. Uh, all the tourists is afraid. Maybe in the the, in the Jordan we have uh, war, but the Jordan it's uh, not not Palestine. It's it's far away. Or well, Jordan it's very safe. Despite Jordan's distance from the conflict, the perception of danger has dealt a severe blow to the country's tourism industry. We have many hotels is closed in this one. Like it's 28 hotels, maybe it's 30. Also. We have uh, 300 person is working in the hotel, but now it's stay away and live in the house, not work, we don't have work. To be the only person riding a camel through the Rose Red City would have been an impossible dream pretty much any other time in history. And being here with no tourists because of the war almost makes it feel like you're discovering it for the first time. It's really amazing. If you like to do shopping, we'll give you a good price. Unfortunately, that dream has become a nightmare for the merchants making their living here. Nice gift to buy from Petra. You a car for one JD. In the high season, we do $200, $300 a day, sometimes $400. Now we make like 10, 15 GD a day, and sometimes none, I mean, no money at all. Like sometimes five, six days, no business. Without tourists, many can no longer feed their families. Well, before uh, so when, uh, October 7th, uh, it was like uh, uh, climbing up to a monastery around 2,000 a day, uh, 5,000 uh, visiting Petra. Down, downstairs, and uh, now we have almost like 50, 40 a day, sometimes 20, maybe more like downstairs, like 100, 150. Across Jordan, hotel occupancies have plummeted to as low as 3% in some areas. Airlines have cut routes and cruise ships have canceled visits. Despite their hardships, many here are reluctant to openly discuss the root cause of their economic woes. 
When asked about the Hamas massacre as a possible reason behind his suffering, Solomon immediately ended the interview, a chilling reminder that people here are very careful not to blame the terror group. As war continues, the economic toll on Jordan and other neighboring countries grows. The once bustling streets of Petra remain silent. Its majestic ruins, both a testament to human ingenuity and a stark reminder of the far-reaching impact of this conflict. From Petra, I'm Chuck Holton for CBN News. One of the terrible results of war is starvation or food insecurity. Israel faces that now since many farmers have left their fields for the front lines. A dwindling food supply could become the new threat to the country's survival. Here's our report. Since the October 7th attack, almost 90% of Israel's farmers have reported significant damage to land, equipment, and livestock. As for servicing the fields, most foreign workers have fled, and many farmers are serving as reservists, with others included in the 80,000 evacuated from growing hostility in the north. First of all, the agriculture in Israel is in danger, because most of the fields are on on the borders. This threat resulted in a rapidly convened conference on Israel's food security that included agriculture experts such as Dr. Liron Amdur and Yoel Zilberman of Hashomer HaChadash, an organization focused on preserving the land and helping farmers. Zilberman tells CBN News the war has highlighted the vulnerability of the food supply because so much is imported. We know that there is one port that got closed because of the Houthis nearby, uh, the, like in the Red Sea, nearby a lot. And the danger on our ports is, like the risk is very, very high in high finished dog. He also added declining food production as a critical threat. Today we are dependent on Ukraine. Today we are dependent on Turkey. Today we are dependent on Jordan. It's unbelievable. Amdur revealed that on the Global Food Security Index, Israel received a zero in commitment to food security policy and food accessibility. About 80% of our calories come from imported food, and especially cereal, which is the basics for what we eat, but also for what the livestock eats, okay? So if we don't have cereals, then we don't have milk, we don't have meat, we don't have eggs, okay? And we hardly produce any in Israel. We produce less than 10% of what we consume. Agriculture industry had uh, lost like 10,000 farmers in the last uh, 20 years. Silberman blames that on the collapse of agricultural collectives known as kibbutzim, combined with the nation's focus on technology and startups. Amdur hopes that given these exposed threats, Israel might see this as a turning point leading to transformation. First of all, food security became an issue. The Ministry of Agricultural and Rural Development, I think about a month ago, they changed their name to the Ministry of Agriculture and Food Security. because. There was no government agency to deal with food security in Israel. Amdur has worked with members of Hashomer HaChadash on a strategy to regenerate agriculture by building on the organization's achievements of the last 17 years. We actually built the biggest volunteer organization in Israel. Today we have more than a quarter of a million volunteers that came to help the farmers. We built like a one-stop shop for a farmer in Israel. They have boarding schools for children that work in the morning for four hours on farms, on actual farms, commercial farms, and then they go and study and finish their high school diploma. And the idea is that these young people will be the future farmers of Israel, including with a youth movement with more than 20,000 kids from all around Israel, including Bedouin kids that wanted to join to our youth movement. They said, we want to be part of this story part of the story of Israel. Daniel Chisen has spent his final school year with Hashomer before entering the IDF. After the army, I would love to be a part of farm work, working on the land. I feel that there's a deeper meaning, an existential meaning. It's tied to our identity and who we are as Israelis. In looking further into the future, Zilberman moved the focus to technology as a key in sustaining the country. Bringing in technology, and bringing in you know, all the new innovations of AI. I think that in many, many ways, this will build the future in Israel, and we need to do a very, very fast move to make sure that Israel will be food independence. Still ahead, spouses swept off to the front lines. How Israel's military families keep going while one parent is away.
Military families face their own struggles when one parent goes off to war. Israel Atalef Foundation supports the families of IDF elite special forces with some added support from their sister organization in the U.S., American Friends of Israeli Navy SEALs. Caitlin Burke reports. Frozen in time, that's the feeling for many within the Jewish community ever since Hamas attacked Israel. The morning of the 7th, everybody remembers like where they were at that moment. Active duty and reserve soldiers alike immediately packing their bags and responding to a call that had not yet come. He just picked up his, you know, his gear, got all his things for reserve duty. His friend from his crew picked him up and he drove straight to the base. And he got ready in like five minutes and he gave me a hug and uh, he said, I'll take your car and, uh, and I'll bring it back. Next time I saw my car, it was three and a half months later. Family members left behind to wonder, worry, and hold down the home front, then and now. I guess I can say it's been a really rough time, a really restless time, a very insecure time, a time where dad most of the time is not at home. And also when he is at home, we are not sure when they will call him um, to go back to the reserve. When her husband deployed, Yael, also a reservist, felt most useful at the military base. A dentist by trade, she put her skills to work, despite being pregnant with her first child. Like we're all, let's say, dentists, teachers, I don't know, lawyers. But then we have like this separate parallel person where we're in the army and this is our job in the army when we're medics and we're officers and like a whole different person and you know how to be this person and this person and you can switch like and in, in, you know between these two different people amira used art as an outlet for her fear and anxiety after her son deployed and i started uh, just uh, dotting leaves and and i saw that i was dotting away and suddenly four hours passed and i hadn't thought of anything so honestly, all I did for the first month is dot leaves. For about 12 hours a day, I have thousands of beautiful leaves dotted. And, um, and that was my therapy. What started as a distraction for her mind became an inspiration for others overcome by war when it was featured in a Knesset exhibit on the resilience of soldiers and families. And I see for my friends, we all going through the anxiety, sleepless nights, you know, taking it medication, having panic attacks, uh, uh, trying to be strong when the boys come back from the army and, you know, holding ourselves. And as soon as they leave, you know, we fall apart again. With her husband still cycling through deployments, Crystal knows that feeling all too well. Still, each day she puts on a brave face for her four children. At one side, life just keeps on going. You know, the children were in school, now they have vacation, they have like a, a program that they, they do uh, things in the vacation. And then, then suddenly there will be rockets fired and you're saying, hey kids, we're okay, everything is fine. And you know, you know it's not okay, and you know it's not fine. And you're all the time acting. The nation, surrounded by enemies, is familiar with living under constant threat. Although this fight is putting the resilience of the Israeli people to the test, making it necessary for outside organizations to step in and provide critical support. Throughout the war, the Atalef Foundation has worked to meet the needs of Israel's most elite special forces unit and also their families. Crystal, Amira and Yael are all part of this community. So I know the Atalef Foundation very, very well throughout the years. and. Constantly, they were reaching out, trying to do like, you know, different uh, projects and support groups. And there was like a phone call that you could always call. Uh, also for, you know, if you want to ask questions, if you want to know what's going on. Psychological sessions for the woman that organizes night, nights out. I was in night out, I think in March, they took us to some kind of stand up nice performance it was really nice and I met the other woman over there and I, I guess it was the first time that actually went out since uh, since the 7th of October. The foundation's sister organization, American Friends of Israeli Navy SEALs, has raised millions for soldiers and their families since this current war began, including support for 500 spouses who are managing their homes, families, and careers alone, and a reintegration program for when their loved ones finally return. Caitlin Burke, CBN News, Washington. 
That's all for this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. Thanks for joining us. And please pray for the return of all the hostages and for comfort for the hostage families who are mourning their loved ones and for those who are still living in suspense. And remember, the God who's watching over Israel and you and me neither slumbers nor sleeps. I'm Julie Stahl. We'll see you next time on Jerusalem Dateline.